partners in conjunction with Almond Sales and Eastwind Offshore Sailing. I want to welcome everybody to today's presentation. We have two great presenters, two very uh, experienced and uh, professional sailors who are going to be taking us through a whole bunch of different uh, start ideas and concerns and things like that. And, and uh, first, I just want to let you guys know that if you uh, Put up, if you go to the top right hand of your screen and you put on find active speaker only, that way then you'll just see the person who is speaking. You won't see all the other photos of all your friends and maybe you can do that later when we're done. Um, also regarding any questions, um, there's a chat chat box on the bottom of your screen. Please put any questions you might have in there and throughout the presentation we'll answer some of those questions or we might wait till the end to answer the questions. We're looking to be on here for about an hour and an hour to an hour and a half depending on uh, um, how things go but I think things should be about 90 minutes. Um, and just let you know you will be muted so um, we will take care of that for you which you're muted right now and so uh, you'll just be hearing the people who are speaking and because I'm going to hand it over to our first presenter. Um, just want to do some thank yous to the folks who are participated in this. Denise George, uh, Greg Rutter from uh, Santa Monica Windjammers, um, and then Miriam Smith, who is our, um, our Zoom expert, and she's been very helpful. Um, and then I'll get, again, Ullman Sales and, uh, and East Wind um, Offshore Sailing. So I'll just tell you a little bit about our presenters. Um, we have two presenters, Greg Dare. Greg is uh, from San Pedro. He grew up in California. He spent a lot of time in his folks' loft, their sailing loft. Uh, in Cabrillo Marina. Um, he reached the top of the Optimus class and learned many skills uh, and proceeded to uh, lead uh, in that class and succeed in one design racing. Greg progressed uh, through many uh, different pl classes and, and placing well into uh, a variety of events. While attending uh, CSUCI, Greg raced in the university circuit and collected many uh, event wins. After college, Greg regularly raced as a tactician in the Far 40 fleet, always placing well um, with a young group of friends. Greg has seen a lot of success as a sailor, but considers coaching to be his greatest sailing ability. Um, he has coached many local One Design sailors to the top of their respective fleets. Uh, three years ago, Greg moved to New Zealand and took a position coaching the Royal New Zealand Yachts Squadron's training programs. Um, Greg is uh, very excited to be part of the Ullman Sailing Team, and he's available for, for coaching. So we'll get you that information at the end as well. Our other presenter is Eric Champagne. Our Eric Champagne grew up, grew up sailing in Southern California from the time he was born. Uh, he holds uh, several world and national titles, as well as many offshore and match racing wins. Currently, he spends time uh, in, with the Etchells and J-70s, uh, managing and campaigning these boats around the globe. Here are a few of the, uh, the wins and placements that Eric uh, Champagne has done. Etchell World's winner, multiple Transpac winner, um, Pacific Cup overall winner, Coastal Cup overall winner, Lipton Cup winner, Etchell's national winner, um, Etchell's North American winner, runner-up for Melgus 24 Worlds, Congressional Cup winner, Argo Bermuda uh, Gold Cup winner, Morgan Cup team, race winner, Martin 242 North Americans winner, Sol, uh, Solon Cup team race winner, Melgus 20 Russian Nationals winner in Italy, and a Melgus 20 Pacific Coast champion winner. So we've got two great presenters that are going to be taking us through some great starting concerns and, and things we have. So I'd like to now introduce you to Greg Dare, our main presenter. So take it away, Greg. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I guess we'll uh, just crack on into it, aren't we? bring up that first slide. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess we started the presentation just before we're even leaving the dock uh, as uh, I don't know, been uh, kind of brought up on the idea that sailing is 90% preparation. And uh, there's definitely a lot of a lot of I's and T's to dot and cross before you actually uh, even leave the dock. So um, just simple things like reading the sailing instructions and making sure you have all that sorted out. Uh, a lot of the times I, I try to bring on a brainy young kid and uh, give them the job of memorizing every single thing that's in all those pieces of papers. And then <laughs> if you pick the right person, they actually do a brilliant job of it because they, they feel like uh, they're a much more important part of the team and they take it quite seriously if you, if you pick the right person. And uh, it's always good to have someone to double check with after you've uh, done your best to memorize it yourself. Um, yeah, I think all that's pretty self-explanatory. It's just uh, whether or not you as a competitive sailor take the time and effort to actually do your homework and, and make sure that you show up to the start line prepared, uh, knowing the courses, knowing the, uh, 
knowing the sailing instructions and the rules you're you're going to be sailing under. Um, it is actually pretty easy to get as something as simple as forgetting the to check the course. Um, and so as you develop as a team, if you can delegate and assign those responsibilities to certain individuals so that it's something that you never have to think of in, in your specific role or, or someone's always assigned to it. Instead of three different people checking the course, you have maybe one person that's always on the radio to make sure they get it um, or visually just on the race committee boat. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, I guess you should have a tactician potentially or someone in charge who, who is really responsible for reading the SIs and the order of starts and getting the course. But uh, there's no harm in a little bit of responsible delegation there and making sure that you have a couple people to back you up, I think, is always uh, makes me feel more comfortable. And then I think we'll uh, kick it over to Eric for the communication. Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. Um, as we'll touch on, uh, I'm sure, a fair amount through, through this whole seminar, communication is key. Um, being able to communicate as a team, report proper information and, and, not, and not worry about bad information. Two, two parts of, of this communication structure that I'm really, really a fan of and I, and I believe really important is delegating two things very specifically. One, who is calling the time at the start? It needs to be someone very active, um, good voice, um, isn't going to get rattled by other things going on on the boat in high intensity situations, be able to keep calling time. More specifically, uh, as we'll talk about soon, there's a lot of, lot of work to be done before we actually start while we're on the race course. And it all takes a bit of time. Um, I like to be on the course a full hour before we race. And the person who's calling time, I don't just want to know five minutes, four minutes, and so forth. I want to know we have a half hour to our warning because we want to go up wind and sail. We'll talk about all that later, but it all takes time and keeping a timeline is quite important. So knowing you're an hour before the start, a half hour before the start and so on is really important. During this specific start sequence, I'm a big fan of every 10 seconds from, from the warning pretty loudly. And then I like the last 20 to 25 seconds every second. And again, loud and clear. Uh, the tactician of the helmsman has to be able to hear you over other other people talking there's always a lot of chatter at starts the second part of the, the communication i think is very important is traffic someone has to be designated to look for traffic and this is mostly important when you're on your final approach on starboard we usually i like sharks and bogeys you're coming along on starboard for your final approach a boat coming behind you that can take your take take you whole take your hole come up and get you to leeward go over the top of you. Anybody coming behind from behind you is a shark. And then anybody coming at you on port that can potentially leap out you uh, is a bogey. Back to you, Greg. Yeah, so uh, we'll just go into mainly a lot of the information gathering that you, you want to put together before you come up with your strategy and your tactics for the race. So for me, I think it's very important to try to hold off all the preconceived notions and, and tactics that you, you, you think you're going to be employing until, uh, until you've actually collected information from that specific day. Because sometimes you'll pick up on some things that uh, you wouldn't have otherwise if you were more closed-minded about it. So the, the process I always try to stick to is really just gathering information. Um, quality, accurate information uh, for as long as I can before I even start to think about actually putting it together. Um, so I kind of try to push, push the hold off on putting the information together until I've uh, really gathered it all for as long as possible. So uh, a few things that we want to do to get good info before we actually start to come up with our pre-start strategy is uh, really just getting in phase with the breeze, the wind patterns, and, and checking any current. Um, Eric's going to talk later about how to check the start line by going off the pin end of the start line and, and going head to wind and sighting 90 degrees to your boat. And that's something I do all the time. And the, the benefit of it is, is you can check the starting line, and that's great. That's, you get a really good visual check uh, on the starting line. And, by, by using that method that we're going to talk through later. But at the same time, 
you're also checking the true wind direction. So if you can check both the, the skew of the starting line and the true wind direction, and then you come back and recheck it uh, at set time intervals. Every five minutes you come back and you're rechecking the start line and the true wind direction. And if you set your watch for three minutes, five minutes, and, and just do it repeatedly, uh, you, you can start to dial into whatever type of pattern that you have for that day, especially if it's not in an oscillating wind venue out in the ocean. If it's a, uh, you know, Cabrillo beach with a full righty and the, and the sea breeze, then, you know, it's a persistent geographic thing and you're not going to dial into the oscillation, so to speak so much. But uh, in Marina del Rey, that's a big thing that I always like to do. Just head to wind outside the pin, check the true wind direction, check the skew of the line, and then do it again five minutes later, do it again five minutes later. And you're going to notice uh, that it is different. You know, the first time it's boat favored, then it's square, and then it's pin favored, then it's square, then it's pin favored, then it's boat favored. And you're just trying to dial into that pattern. Um, and I, I really like to, like I said already, just try to focus on collecting quality information before I start to say, okay, it's, it's going to be, a, we're going right, it's going to be boat favored. Um, I keep checking and keep checking, and sometimes you find some lefties. Um, I want to talk about tides and currents a little bit too. Uh, the one thing you want to think about for that is depending on the venue, is it, are we in a venue where we're going to have more, more or less uniform current across the entire race course, or do we have shallow water on one side and deep water on the other, where we're going to be seeing different current on one side of the course to the other. So if it's all uniform current, all the way across the race course, we're just out in open ocean and there's not very many variations in the depth. Um, then we really only have to check the current in one location and that factors into our ley lines, our approaches, um, both for the start and for the top mark. Uh, and then if we're at a location where like in Santa Barbara where it's really shallow on the right side of the course and, and a lot of deep water on the left, then we might be trying to check the current on each side and recording the difference between the two. So we know how many boat lengths a minute we're, we're giving up on the right side of the course relative to the left side of the course. And actually the best way that I've found to check uh, current is just to squirt a little bit of sunscreen in the water. So I know people do water bottles, sponges, and uh, things like that. I've always found uh, if, you, you, if you go with sunscreen, it actually kind of becomes the water. And if you, uh, Go to the bay model in san francisco they they squirt dyed water into the water to see where it's moved so it's basically a similar idea as that um and then we'll try to try to time it with a watch and see how long it takes the sunscreen to go a certain distance and direction and then do the same thing on the other side of the course and come up with some type of difference um or if it's the same whatever it is you just, just try to collect the info as, as best as you can um it's always good to do a speed test if you can, especially if you're in a one design boat. If you find someone else on the race course who you know is fast and you line up dead even with them, full, full pace upwind, um, just to confirm that your, your settings are all the way you won't want them and there's nothing else to change on your boat. Uh, we could dig way into how to prep a boat between races, but we're going to try to skip that and keep it all about the starts. But um, depending on the class of boat and if you are needing to adjust the rig between races to make sure you're at full speed for the next one. That's can actually be really, really critical. And it's up to the team to delegate, delegate and prioritize. How are we going to be collecting the tactical information between these two races and also um, winding on the turns that we need to get the rig on. So that that's, that's actually a really serious and deliberate process that you have to figure out as a team. Um, Time and distance in the starting area is a big one for me. So everyone can see this now, I think. Um, so if we just have a start line here, and that's a pin ley line and a boat end ley line, um, I'll like to start out pretty much at the boat end with uh, five minutes on my watch and just run down the line, right down the line to the pin. 
then when I get to the pin end, I'll do the biggest, longest jibe that I can, trying to get as far downwind as I can. And uh, you become limited here by your boat speed, because as you go dead downwind, depending on the type of boat you're in, you, you, you really start to slow down and get coaxed into tightening up the turn. Uh, so we're looking at ending up on port tack, maybe six boat lengths below the line, and then just paralleling it back this way. And I'm not thinking super hard when I'm doing this. All I'm doing is just really becoming comfortable, familiar, and at home with the, the speed of my boat relative to the starting box. And you know, this was something I did at the last Far 40 regatta that I did. And uh, I was hopping on with a brand new team and we, we were still getting used to each other and uh, even on the way out to the race course. So this for me is a strategy that really makes me feel confident and comfortable on the race course. Um, just cause it kind of almost subconsciously dials me into my time on distance. So I'll reach below the starting line on port tack here. And then I'll actually head the boat up onto a close hauled course at this point, as I'm approaching this boat end lay line. And I like to go onto a close hauled course cause from here I can pick the right time to tack and approach the starting line up this lay line. Um, which is, you know, really always a good angle to approach a start line from on a close hauled course on starboard tack. So, and by making an adjustment on port tack to a close hauled course, it makes it easy for me to sight this ley line and pick the right time to tack the same way that you would calling a ley line to a top mark. Um, whereas if you're just beam reaching like the normal pre-start circle move and try to whip into a tack, it can be a more extreme and less controlled angle change. So it becomes more difficult to place your tack. So uh, yeah, this is kind of the, just the normal pre-start circle. And I'm just doing this by myself even uh, as I get out, just to familiarize myself with sometimes, especially if you're sailing different boats and different people, it, this is a really good routine to get familiar with the course and the start line and your, the speed of your boat. So. I'll do a few circles with a five minute watch, just kind of figuring out uh, about how long it takes to do each circle. And then as the time winds down into the final minute, I'll, I'll start thinking about practicing some type of approach, whether that's lining up on the boat end lay line on starboard tack in the final minute and practicing my time on distance to the gun, or even tacking in the middle and just going for the middle. Um, or up the pin end, where, depending on where I am in the circle or what I'm trying to practice for the for the given race course. Um, but it seems like a very simple thing, but this is huge for me. It, it really, really, really gets me feeling at home and comfortable on a starting line. Um, kelp check is always a big one. If you can make the kelp check something very routine, and that's something else, maybe you delegate to someone else, because uh, for me. I can be too caught up in trying to plan the tactics on the race and, and very easily forget to check for kelp. So I might have that same sailing instruction helper be the guy who's reminding me. Uh, like around six minutes, as soon as they do the warnings, usually a good time to back down for kelp. Usually as late as you can possibly do it and still be comfortable preparing yourself for the starting line. So line bias, we're gonna kind of cover a few different ways to check the starting line later. But like I said, a big important thing for me there is that every time I'm checking the line bias, I'm also trying to phase myself into the wind pattern at the same time. So it's, it's, it's kind of two birds with one stone there. We don't wanna just check the line. We wanna check the line and then use that as a tool to tell us are we in a right phase and a left phase or, or somewhere in the average. Um, And starting objective, that's kind of coming in course objective. That's We're just talking about putting all the information together a little bit later once we've correct, collected good information. And um, the true wind direction, average relative to the course, that's just a more complex way of saying the same thing that I was saying, that we're, we're always trying to monitor the true wind direction um, relative to the start line and, and also relative to the position of the weather mark. Because uh, as, as it's shifting righties to lefties and back and forth, the long tack can 
potentially be changing and when as the long tack changes your your tactics change quite a bit um yeah i also like to think about take uh, i usually take a moment and starts to before the start actually happens to think about the fleet that i'm racing in and what the behavioral tendencies of that fleet and the sailors in it are um if it's a fleet where i know for whatever reason everyone is a tendency to be super aggressive and fight for the boat end, even if it's just barely favored. Um, and that can coax me to start in an empty hole in the middle of the line. Um, but overall, we're just trying to look at what side of the course is favored, where that first puff's going to come from, what side of the start line is the current going to bunch everybody into, and where where is the starting line to most likely to have a really, really dense pack of boats where it's hard to find clear air and get away clean. And where are the open spaces on the starting line likely to be? And part of that is after, once you're actually in the pre-start, keeping yourself in a position where you can see what's going on instead of getting lost in the crowd. Um, risk reward analysis. We want to think also about what we actually need to accomplish for the given race. So if it's the first race of the regatta, usually we're just thinking, what's the easiest way to take a low risk start and get off clean um, and keeping it simple, maybe starting in the middle and clear air. And then as you get towards the end of the regatta, you find yourself in a situation where, uh, you know, maybe you got a big gap behind you and you're one point behind the guy in front of you. And so you're actually, suddenly that's very different to the first first start of the regatta when you're, um tactically looking out for individual boats or or if you're you have a big gap and you just need to win the pin and win the left because that's what the race is telling you to do and for that race and that event you need to win that race to hit your goal um especially if you have a gap behind you and you, you have some room to make mistakes sometimes you can afford to be way more risky and go for broke um but it's you want to try to be deliberate and, and have some thought and do a little math about the scores and figure out what you should actually be going for. Um, the one, the one interesting one is in racing 420 dinghies, which uh, all, it's a common youth sailing class that I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with, but, 420s are relatively wide boats that sail pretty wide and low angles. So if you have someone to lure of you off the starting line, you're, you're really going to struggle living in the lane. And when the pin end of the starting line becomes favored in a, in a boat that's kind of low angled and slow, um, what is the lowest risk start to do? And in, in the 420 fleet, if you start in the middle of the starting line, in an open gap when the pin's favored, the people who have terrible starts off the pin end are still gonna attack and cross you. Um, so one low risk strategy in 420s when the pin's favored actually becomes to throw yourself right in the middle of the mess at the pin end and go for it and just know how to stay out of trouble and just get off the line without being over or stuck below the pin lay line. You don't need to win the start, you know, so, th and in that situation we're mitigating risk by being okay with being second or third row off the starting line and maybe not pushing it so much um but the biggest thing is that we actually do get off at the pin end and take a couple tacks into clear air was it if you're in the middle or at the boat end in that situation even if you nail the start um you can come off worse very very easily so that was just in kind of a weird situation I wanted to touch on because it's unique, but it, it, there's a lot of different risk reward scenarios that can play out depending on the information you gather. So I think Eric's going to take us into a few different ways to check the line here. Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. If you can uh, clear your drawing there. Yeah. Nice. Um, there's a couple of ways to find the favorite end. There's sort of a very simple way and then there's a mathematical way. Simple way is just that simple. Two ways of doing the simple way. One, you can simply go to the middle of the start line and go head to wind, right in the middle of the start line, like position number one on your screen. And whichever way your bow is pointing closer to, the pin or the boat, it's 
pointing closer to the pin, the pin is favored. If it's pointing closer to the committee boat flag, the committee boat's favored. It's as simple as that. Um, very clean, very direct, very easy. Um, another way, which uh, Greg uh, talked about earlier and is a very big fan of, is position two, where you sail outside, basically sail below the start line and go head to wind so that while you're head to wind, you can sight down through the pin to the committee boat flag. And if the committee boat is behind your beam or 90 degrees to your boat, the pin's favored. And if the committee boat is above 90 degrees to your boat, your beam, then the committee boat is favored. Um, Greg talked about this earlier, but you get, you get a couple of things at the same time. You get to see a visual of what ends favored, and you also get the head to wind that Greg has been talking about that is so important. It's so important that when we do it on our J70 or Nettles, I actually have a pencil near wherever I am and I write on the boat, on the cabin side, anywhere, you know, um, anywhere I can. And I will write the head to wind number down. And a lot of times I'll write the time next to it. And if we are on the course an hour or a half hour or 45 minutes before the start and every four or five minutes we've written down that head to wind number, like Greg said, you will see a pattern developing and you'll have a nice clear picture of if the wind is oscillating or shifting in one direction and staying. Um, next slide, please. So this is a little more accurate uh, way of finding the favored end. Um, we will sail down the line on port. You can do it on starboard also, but I like port. I actually like being outside the pin and lining up the pin with the boat and getting a heading on the start line, a physical heading. So in this example, the physical heading of our start line is 340 degrees. So we know minus 90. If the wind were at 250 degrees, it would be a square line. Now you can go head to wind, or perhaps you've already done your head to wind, like Greg had said. And if you go head to wind and you get, say, a 265, you instantly know that the boat is 15 degrees favored. Knowing the heading on the line, I think, is uber important knowing that it's 340 on the line, meaning that 250 is a square line, you can go head to wind anywhere. It doesn't have to be at the pin. It doesn't have to be in the middle. It doesn't even have to be on the line. You can go head to wind anywhere, assuming you're in clean air, you're not below another boat. And you will know if the line bias is changing basically at all times. You anything to add there, Greg? Yeah, actually, can we go back two slides to the first one? So the, just the one thing I wanted to touch on here, my, the reason I'm such a big fan of method two here is that it gives you a very accurate visual representation of what you're dealing with. So when you're off the, off the pin end, head to wind, sighting through the pin, the, you see the actual starting line itself, and then you want to compare that to the line that's actually 90 degrees off your boat, so your beam reach angle. So you should basically have two lines that you're, you're comparing to each other, uh, the, the starting line line, the actual line, and what the starting line should be based on 90 degrees from your true wind direction, which you're actually sighting visually. Um, and then when I'm looking at it that way, I can look and see, okay, at the, in the middle of the starting line right now, uh, I'm giving up a boat length to the guys who start at the pin. You know, if it's pin favored, I can actually see the, the physical distance that I'm giving up. Or I can see, I can judge that at, at the boat end of the line, maybe it's two boat lengths worth of, worth of distance that we're giving up. So even though there's no numbers involved in this method, uh, it actually produces some really accurate information that, that, I, that, that, that I can use. So. Yeah, I, th I wanted to just touch on that real quick and then we can go back two slides to where we were before. So, yeah, the main thing we're trying to talk about with this one is after you've collected the information, how do you actually put it together? Um, into some type of strategy. So we wanna, I guess just, if you get together and chat as a team, or if you just have one guy who, who thinks about it on their own or, or however it works, but you, you should have some type of conversation about what wind patterns you, you've 
you've gathered by checking the starting line as many times as you have and, and, and factor in the current and then factor in any geographic wind patterns that you won't uh, notice by checking the oscillations. Whereas if you're out in the ocean and the wind's oscillating back and forth at the starting line, but you have a, a geographic righty as you get closer to the shore and sail on port tack, um, that's something that you want to think about that you're you're not going to get just by checking the line. So, so it's, uh, yeah, it's just, that's my process anyway, is just collect all the information, spend a long, as much time as I can just collecting quality information on the race course. And then after we've gathered it all, kind of thinking about how we put it, put it all together. Um, and then sometimes we, we, we don't know, you know, we, we've, we've done the best that we can to figure out what's going on in the race course. And we're, we're still like, man, I, man, guys, I really don't know what's going on here. So there was one in the, in the J 70 winter series in Marina del Rey, there was a situation where uh, we had a, a really regular oscillating wind condition. And then, a massive shift came in. Uh, I guess it was a, it must have been a righty because the boat end ended up way favored. So this big right shift came in and the left had been paying all day. Uh, and it was kind of uncharacteristic from the previous pattern. And we were having a really, really tough time trying to decide if the righty that came in was a big picture geographic thing that was going to continue oscillating in that direction or if it was gonna go back and recorrect to the old breeze and fall back to the old pattern. And we, uh, you know, I was talking with Chuck Eaton who trims on the boat and we, we were really uh, kind of out of sorts, couldn't figure out what we were, what we were gonna do. Um, but the boat end was favored. And so the strategy that we ended up going with was starting at the boat end and just holding our lane on starboard after the start and playing the fleet. So we had, you know, a pretty open-ended plan of, you know, we want to get this start. And then we know that regardless of whether the righty comes left next or the lefty comes next, we're going to be able to make it work if we just position ourselves smart and maintain positions of good leverage relative to the guys next to us. So, um, and then that one, we ended up with getting the good boat end start we wanted and a f everyone actually who started at the boat kind of tacked out to the right and we maintained our lane all the way across to the left and a big lefty came in um and really we went left because the guys who started at the pin to the left of us were looking more dangerous and more threatening than the guys who tacked out and went to the boat and it was basically just playing the probabilities as we let the race unfold um and then other times, like in at Cabrillo Beach or in Santa Barbara, with a with a sea breeze, you get a pretty closed closed plan where you know if you're not heading to the right corner pretty quick, you're going to be out of luck. Um, yeah, the one thing I'll touch on there real quick is a lot of people think at both of those venues when when the right side's super favored and it's a geographic thing that that you need to win the boat and then bang the right corner. And my strategy is always, it's different. I, 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 if, you know, when it's that full, full on sea breeze, it's just really favoring the right side of the course when you go to the beach because the, the land's bending the wind to the right. Um, my strategy is always, how do I get a clean lane on port tack one minute after the start, taking the least amount of risk possible. And sometimes that's starting at the pin uh, by myself and then just tacking into a clean lane. So, so instead of focusing on winning the boat and banging the right, my vision is on how do I have myself in a lane on port tack one minute after the start where I'm in control of my options and, and I'm making my own decisions, not getting tacked on and ping pong by the other people. And quite often I end up to the left of the group of guys that are racing hard to the right. Um, but I'm in my own lane and I've taken way less risk to get there. So, yeah, I think that's a good example of, you know, sometimes you collect all the information about the race course and you have a, a really, really high degree of certainty, you know, this is what's going to happen. And, and I have to, this is my tactics. This is my strategy. I'm going to do that, that one thing 
um, whether it's long tack starboard first, long tack port first, and and then sometimes you really don't have it defined so clearly in your head when you don't know what the wind's going to do. And when you have a low degree of certainty about the breeze, there's a strong chance that everyone else in the race course is in the same boat. Um, so just managing the risk and focusing on playing the fleet and not letting everyone, le not letting anybody, any large packs of boats open up some big leverage on you to one side or the other is what I focus on then. So this is a drill that I do in any new one design boat that I hop into uh, to really dial in our starting. And the first thing that I'm going to focus on is boat handling only without any time on distance or no starting line or anything. It's just a simple boat handling maneuver that we're going to practice. Um, so the way that I, I'm going to, back up for a sec uh the way that i like to think about s sailing in general actually and, s and start specifically is um if we had a computer simulation that was based on the racing rules of sailing and the laws of physics um and everyone sailed perfectly you know there's limited options and moves and things that you can do under those rule sets so if if, if we programmed uh all the world's best sailors to, to do a race you know a virtual race and none of them made a mistake what is that start line approach going to look like and i think what you're going to end up with because of the racing rules of sailing is everyone doing some the whole fleet of boats doing some type of high build approach where they're hitting full pace on an, on a lower angle on starboard pretty far from the line dialing up into this high build where they're coasting almost head to wind towards the line, um, kind of slowing their speed, manipulating their time on distance to position themselves properly. And then most importantly, trying to open up a gap to lured as they're heading into their position. Uh, and then hitting the trigger pull point and putting the bow down and accelerating and going. So I, th I think the, the higher of a level that you get to, the the higher of an angle everyone's going to start approaching the line from so when we're all just learning to start for the first time everyone's beam reaching in um kind of barging in heading up and going at the last minute and then when you get to the highest level the guys are approaching the line 90 degrees different than that coming at it head to wind with a bunch of pace um and just letting their momentum glide them head to wind towards the line so <clears throat> So just walking through this, uh, it's it's this has been really difficult for me to define actually in a drill. I always try to gamify things and and just make the simplest rule set and instruction set that I can, and then have the sailors practice it based off of that. And coming up with the perfect instructions and set of rules for this drill is actually quite different because st difficult because um, starting is such a dynamic thing. Um, but basically, we're just Aiming to go, I you actually don't usually set the marks as shown in this picture. I kind of just do it without marks, but the marks could be useful. If, if the wind shifts two degrees, the uh, the marks become useless. So they're, they're kind of just in this example as a visual representation to help illustrate it. But the drill is just full pace on a beam reach, maybe slightly higher. And then once you have your boat is loaded up at the highest boat speed possible, you want to put it into this high build mode where you're just coasting head to wind for as long as possible. And what I've drawn here is these, these lines here, this ladder rung and these arrows pointing this way. And what I'm aiming to illustrate is that the goal is to go as far in this direction as we possibly can without tacking. So kind of like sailing straight up wind you can't sail straight up wind so we can't actually go the direction that we want to go um because the rule set here is we're not allowed to tack so 
after rounding this mark with the most speed possible, how far in this direction can we get without tacking? And, and really, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this all in one acceleration and then one deceleration before pulling the trigger at this point and going. Um, so if we're just sailing along on a close hauled course here at this angle, we're not climbing the ladder rung at all. We're not opening up any gap to leeward whatsoever. And the way most people approach a starting line is actually at a beam reach. So if we can go on the head, at a head to wind angle approaching this as well, we're, we're climbing up these ladder rungs as we go forward and opening up, opening up a gap to leeward. Now, if we go head to wind too far too soon, then our boat's just gonna stop. And obviously that is gonna end the climbing of the ladder as well. So um, the drill is basically around this bottom mark. And then after you rounded that with full pace, how far up this ladder rung can you climb without tacking the boat? So just head to wind or maybe you're as high as you can with your sails fully strapped and just barely have the leech of the main working. So you have a little bit of something pushing you forward. Depending on the sea state and the boat, it's a different mode. So if you're flat water in a heavy boat with a lot of pace, you can basically just go head to wind and glide for a really long time. Now, if you're in a lighter boat in the ocean with a lot of waves, you're probably at a little bit lower of an angle, but whatever it is you're trying to do, whatever you can to climb in this direction as much as possible without tacking. So that's a little, confusing but hopefully that makes sense um yeah and then and then we want to add in trying to do that boat handling maneuver and sinking into an, an approach to a starting line so now we want to add the time add the starting line and so a lot of boats here probably 45 seconds is about when you're beam reaching uh, 40, 30 to 40 seconds, you're rounding this mark and then gliding head to wind for, for 20 seconds or so and then pulling the trigger in the final 10 seconds. Um, but to have this all dialed in and synced up with perfect timing and positioning it is really, really quite difficult. So if you see, um, you know, if this is our was our starting line. And someone approached the pin, the pin end starting line and did this boat handling drill perfectly. And then at the very end of it, they ended up in this position here with full speed right at the gun. There's nothing you can do to defend that guy or take the pin end away from this guy, really. Um, you're not gonna be able to come in if this guy actually executes this properly, you're not gonna be able to come into leeward of him and tack to leeward of him because he's got full pace here. You're not gonna sit there head to wind with him and still lay the pin. Um, so if, if this guy executes this properly, there's nothing you can do. This guy's gonna win the start, but it, this is very, very difficult to actually get done. Um, Actually, can we go back just for a sec? Um, so I just, these two terms I wanna just touch on real quick because they define what the actual drill is pretty well. Um, boats tend to have a point where the, the flow on the keel and the rudder stalls out and suddenly you drop a tenth a knot in boat speed and it's going to add a full 10 seconds to your acceleration. Uh, like in, in the far 40s, we're usually making sure the boat never goes below three knots as we do this high build. And if we see 2.9 knots on the speedometer, uh, on the speedo, that's, that, that means we've, we've got too slow, we've crossed on the wrong side of the stall point, and now the boat's going to take an extra 10 seconds to get up to full speed. Because it's basically the point at which the foils cavitate and the, and the water flow becomes disrupted. And then when you have to reestablish that initial flow over the keel, suddenly that, that takes so much longer to get going again. So this drill is all about maintaining that high mode for as long as possible. Um, just, and you're, you are decelerating as you do it, 
but you want to just only slow down right up to the point where your foils are still working and and then hit the trigger pull the trigger before they actually stop working um and when you can match up that point of right before you're about to stall with the acceleration point which is you know the spot on the line that you're aiming to pull the trigger to hit where you want to start if you can match those two points up that's what a perfect start approach is and if that may, hopefully that makes sense it's very very difficult to do I'm, I'm still struggling myself but i think at least defining what you're trying to accomplish is helpful and this is a we luckily we found some pictures that's actually a pretty brilliant example of it <clears throat> so the far 40 fleet's really pretty good at approaching the starting line uh from close hauled angles or higher so you see a lot of boats here um, most boats are at least close hauled, if not higher, all in the high build phase. And the boat in the middle, Strungy Light, is the one that we're going to focus on. Oh, that's the wrong control. This guy right here, this uh, boat with the jib that's backwinded, the dark gray boat with the red stripes. Um, and just before this is when they would have been full full speed on a beam reach behind everybody came in with a ton of pace and went right into that high build trying to climb up that ladder uh that i was just talking about before and they've pushed it they've, they're really pushing the issue quite hard here nearly becoming attacking boat but you can see this massive gap to lure that they've opened up for themselves and they're going to have a brilliant acceleration because they've worked on climbing this ladder uh to windward in their approach to the start so I think this is something that really you want to figure out and put a lot of practice in, into starting. Instead of, instead of just beam reaching down the line and heading up and going, how do we actually be, you know, beam reaching down the line really far away from it, dialing up into a well above a close hauled course and ghosting with that momentum towards the line as we open up a gap to leeward and, and uh, solidify our, our lane and then pulling the trigger and going. So if you go to the, next photo we can see here at this point they're definitely not the closest boat to the line so you see boat 10 12 and and uh, this australian boat over here are all really close to the line and slow so i think there's still probably 10 seconds on the clock here or something like this the uh, the boat that we're looking at bow 15 probably has the highest boat speed on the whole fleet based on what I'm, I've seen here. Uh, they've got the biggest lane, they put the bow down before everyone else because they carved out such a massive hole for themselves. Um, and now they're really putting the bow down and going. And I think the next picture is a little bit more of the same. Uh, but you can see they've pulled out, they've kind of nose forward on the guy next to them. And they're very, very safe in terms of not being called OCS here. Uh, you know, the race committee is going to be seeing bow four and bow 10, who are both down speed and slow. And by the time when 15 actually winds up and goes onto the breeze, they're going to fly out of there and then also have a massive gap to lure to work with to put the bow down if they need after the start. I was just thinking of going through all those one more time, but we'll just press on. Um, so the first kind of start that we're going to talk about is just simply winning the boat end of the start line, because I know that's something a lot of people put a lot of focus on, and it's something we've all thought about quite a lot. Uh, there's obviously quite a lot of control in winning the boat end and being to the windward of the fleet with the starboard guard. Um, so tactically, it's a very strong position. Uh, it's potentially a risky thing to do, always going for that start. But if you have it well practiced and you have a routine, you can have a accurate degree of certainty to which you're going to get off the line clean in that situation to, to decide whether or not you want to go for it. Um, so next slide, and then we're going to talk about the theory of how you actually go about approaching it. <clears throat> So this uh, is a two minute drill that I do a lot of the time. Uh, it's probably, 
it's it's one of the best drills that you can really do. Um, it it's quite cool how it illustrates fundamentals of starting sailboats really well. So what it effectively is is it's a it's a two boat drill. So it's a match race, but in a match race, first you're doing a dial up uh, where the port and starboard boat kind of go head on at each other, and then you end up in a circling phase where you're chasing each other around doing circles, trying to out boat handle and out tactic each other. Um, this drill, if, if both match racers are very, very, you know, are, are relatively perfect, they're going to end up into this phase after the circling phase, which is two boats on port tack, uh, just kind of reaching into what's called the playground or that's what Dave Perry likes to call it anyway. Um, in a relatively even scenario. Um, and then the rules for this drill, are that you only get one tack or one jibe. So instead of making it about, you know, I can do three good tacks and out position this guy, I only get one. So I really need to make sure I put it in the perfect spot. Otherwise, if I, if I tack too late, the other boat's gonna turn around in front of me and block me from getting to the line. If I tack too early, the other boat's gonna come in behind me and push me to the line. Um, so it's a very, very simple set of rules to set up this drill. And if you just let good sailors run with that rule set, they're going to do some quite impressive sailing and good practice as a result. So what we're, we're starting out with is one boat leading in ahead of the, this, this green boat's ahead of the red boat. And this is when you start two minutes right when they're both on port tack reaching above the boat end. Uh, if it's bigger boats, you can make it three minutes or whatever it is. But the, the whole point is it's one run away from the starting line, turning back and into a final approach. Uh, this red boat's following the green. And the distance between the two is important because if the red boat is right on the transom of the green boat, he can control the green boat's turnaround and kind of force some tactics. And we were trying to keep that out of the situation and make it more about picking the perfect moment to turn around and controlling your time on distance. If the green boat is really, really far ahead of the red boat, he can complete attack or a jibe and line the red boat up on starboard. So we don't want that either. So what we're aiming for here is that if the green boat in this situation did a jibe and attack and came around behind the red boat, they would effectively switch positions exactly with no real change to the situation. So we're looking for just a fair gap between the two. The green boat's gonna reach away from the line on port, the red boat's gonna follow. And what's interesting here is the angle that they end up reaching away from the line from. So if, if our green boat's new to the drill and beam reaches away from the line, and the red boat's able to follow him, and the red boat's any good, what we're gonna find is that when the green boat turns around and heads to the line this way, the red boat should quite easily be able to position themselves to lure of him in a position where they can head him up and lock him out. Um, so there's, I, I, I used to do a drill when I was coaching team racing where I would, we'd do a two on one drill, which is essentially the same drill, but we'd have, I would, I would be the green boat leading away from the situation. And I would have two, two of the kids I was coaching chasing me. And their only goal was just to not let me start. Um, they didn't even have to get a good start to themselves. It's just, how can we punish Greg and prevent him from getting off the line? And, and then we'd switch it up and, and I wasn't always the one getting beat up. Sometimes we'd, we'd switch it up, but it's a, the whole drill is meant to bring out all the defensive strategies that you can do in a start to make sure that no matter what happens around you, you can get off and nobody can control you and take you out of the race. Um, and so there's safe angles to sail away from the line on, on port tack and there's dangerous angles. If you're reaching away high, that's dangerous because the other guy can hook you to leeward when you turn around. If you're going too low, you know, and then you're ending up jibing around here, that could be dangerous too, because you can't defend from a hook without going below the pin end lay line. If you have to head down at all to defend, now you're too low and below the lay. Um, 
So usually if you're turning around somewhere close to the starboard ley line, that turns out to be quite a safe place to be. Um, so there's always, as the situations develop, safe and dangerous places to be relative to the boats around you. And uh, we want to always be thinking about and focusing on the ley lines to figure out where those are. So typically, this this green boat's gonna broad reach away on port on port tack, um, and then just as a general guideline, a minute and twenty seconds would be a pretty good time for them to jibe around and approach the line. So if they jibe at a minute and twenty seconds, they're gonna be forty seconds away from the starting line with a minute and 20 left on the clock, and they're gonna have 40 seconds to kill. So they basically have to sail to the starting line at half speed, um, or a little slower than that to leave room for a full acceleration at the end. And that's, oh, in match racing and in fleet racing, that's a pretty accurate generalization, I think, in terms of the time on distance that you're setting up. Uh, I know in the J70s and in the Vipers, a lot of the times on the Velocitech, we're in our, in our coast up to the line mode, we're doing a, a meter a second. Uh, and then as we wind into full speed, we're doing two meters a second. So okay, Rita. on that, the instrument can kind of help you. Um, but overall, if you can reach down the ley line on port, jibe onto the ley line on starboard, in a position where you have a two to one ratio of time left on the clock and, and time that you have to burn to put yourself on time. That's usually a, a very, very safe place to be. Um, in this example here, the green boat's gonna jibe and the red boat is gonna tack. And the reason that the red boat can jibe if he wants, but if he jibes, he's gonna be coming out in the bad air and behind the green boat with no good means of pushing him towards the starting line. So it's tactically a, a very weak position. Um, now, if coming out of, if coming out of the initial turnaround, if the green boat's on a close hauled angle approaching the line from here and the red boat's tacked and been able to position himself here, from here, the red boat can sail full speed to the start line and threaten to jump over in, into the front of the green boat. Um, so if he does that, the green boat's forced to go full speed to the line, in which case now the red boat can go put the bow down with pace on a beam reach and go for a hook, in which case the, red, the green boat has to put the bow down to defend. Um, so by tacking here and keeping yourself to windward of this guy, but still in a position where you can put the bow down and get your, your bow behind his transom and not getting hooked is a very tactically advantageous position as opposed to trying to push control the guy from this situation and his bad air coming in front for a hook. Um, and then this video is effectively a two minute drill that we just talked about when you throw in a pier into the middle of the situation as well. Um, so this start has basically already been won before this video starts because uh, the, it's Scotty Dixon that took the lead off the other boat in this situation and started to approach the starting line first. And when they have the pier that they have to snake all the way around, it gives them a massive opportunity to hug the pier and kill a lot of time. Um, so. It's, it's effectively, it's just that same two minute drill we were talking about, but uh, with the pier thrown in just for a little bit of extra fun. So yeah, Sorry. I think we're gonna play the video next and uh, take a break on the talking. <laughs> Oh, 
Yeah, so there's a bunch of interesting stuff going on there. Um, <clears throat> the communication on board is actually a pretty good example that we can take a lot away from. Uh, typically, these kind of, this is Congressional Cup, I believe, unless it's thicker. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's Con Cup. So if you get match racing at that level, the onboard communication as you approach the starting line is going to be pretty spot on. And uh, if you watch, if just watching a few, high level match races and paying attention to the audio is going to really give you a lot of strategies to work into even your Wednesday night team that'll make a massive difference. So they've got up to three people communicating on a match race team. You got one person simply calling the time. Uh, you could have a different person calling the lay lines and then a third person calling how much time you, your boat is now away from the starting line and how much time you have to burn. You could have one person calling all of those three things or you can delegate it between the people. But um, so in, in this example, we've got someone calling time. Uh, I think we've got somebody else calling the ley lines and then we have someone else calling how far away from the starting line they are. And all of that information being re relayed to the skipper really gives him uh, a much higher sense of awareness as he's approaching the starting line. Whereas if he's doesn't know how far away from the line he is, doesn't know where the lay lines are and no one's communicating that to him, he's, he's kind of shooting in the dark and he's focused on the other boats that are immediately around him and his immediate tactical situation. So while he's focused on that, it's very critical to have someone delegated to thinking ahead a few moves at the same time. Um, I mean, you could even have a fourth or a fifth crew looking up, try to figure out what the first puff and shift of the beat's going to be at this point while everyone else is distracted with all this chaos. Um, and then we could also talk about the rules later on that one because that was interesting too, if anyone wants. Port bias to starting line. Um, <clears throat> the port bias starting line, it is really important to think about the risk reward factors that we were talking er about earlier. And, knowing the fleet well is are we sailing in a fleet where people are scared of the pin end and hesitant to put themselves there in which case sometimes if the pin ends favored and you know what you're doing you can just take it off everyone pretty easily if they're if, if it's a timid fleet um but if everyone's uh if you're sailing against 40 chris rabs who are just happy to stack themselves right on the ley line and go for it uh there's going to be a massive pile up so understanding the psychology of the fleet that you're racing against really helps to open up the possibilities of what you can and can't do to get off a starting line. So thinking about that and ahead of time is a big one. And then actually having a bit of a discussion to figure out, are we trying to start in the middle of the line just to windward of this massive clump? Or do we think we can actually go for winning the pin and make it happen? So a few, I'll hit two, two things that I do if I actually want to try to win the pin. Let's say this is the lay line. If this is our port tack angle to the starting line, if this is the lay line, and then we have the starting line here, and I'm going for a crowded pin end start, kind of like that 420 situation I was talking about earlier, where um, it's so critical to be at the pin end because it's that favored and it's such a massive gain that you, you're forced to do it even though it's chaotic. If you can come out of the chaos even alive, you're gonna be better off than the guys in the middle of the boat. So how do you make sure that you're going to get off the line safe without doing circles or being over early? Um, and we're not even trying to focus on winning the start at this point. It's just a crazy pin end. We just want to make sure we get off in a situation that we can, you know, take a tack or two to find clear air. Um, and one really simple and effective thing that I always try to do is keep myself halfway between these two lines as I approach it. Um, you know, so if it's a minute away, I want to be 30 seconds from the pin end with a minute halfway between these two lines approaching it this way, you know, and if someone's going to be approaching it 
right from the pin and lay, pin and lay line, that guy is going to win the pin off me, but he's going to take way more risk to make it happen. And I'm much happier to take less risk and start just a, a lane or two above that guy. So, you know, for me, the, the, the clues that are going to guide me into a safe pin end start is the, the, the pin end lay line and, and the starting line itself. And just putting myself halfway between those two lines. And then when it gets really extreme, if it becomes even more pin favored, I mean, that's almost 40 to five degrees off what I drew there. The safe area to be becomes a lot smaller, which means there's a lot fewer boats that can actually end up in it. So if you just try to sail right up the middle of this channel between these two lines with good time on distance, and then just sheet in and go, try to take off, keep it safe, keep it clean. I think for me, that really simplifies it. And then the other pin end strategy that I do all the time is just being the last guy to chase in from port. So uh, typically everyone's on port in the last two minutes of the starting line. Between two and one minute, everyone's sailing on port below the line. Uh, Depending on the level of the fleet, it can be very easy to just be the last guy in line, tack to lure to the next guys, focus on your time on distance and go. Uh, I would definitely recommend practicing that and, and giving it a go a few times. There's a really good chance it'll go bad on you and, and you're not going to be happy with what happens. But every time that you get that result, that's something that you're going to learn from big time. And if you're never, I, I think it is good to set some time some practice time or even sacrifice her regatta and say, we're going to learn how to win the ends at this event. And, and that's our goal. And, and you're going to have to get it wrong to get it right. But if you do know how to get it right and judge your degree of certainty and, and, and going for that strategy, uh, it, it, it really opens up your playbook and gives you a lot of effective options. So with a square line with oscillating breeze, so we've uh, just been off the pin end of the starting line, checking the, checking the starting line multiple times. And in the right phase, the boat's favored. In the left phase, the pin's favored. But overall, it seems uh, really quite square. And we can't really decide what end's favored. But we do know the wind is oscillating back and forth. Uh, at that point, we need to decide where do we want to be halfway up the beat? You know, are we feeling that we're trying to play the middle, right, middle, left? Uh, usually we're not trying to go for the corners in this type of situation. And then we want to find the lowest density area on the starting line. That's going to line us into that strategy. Um, so if in this type of situation in the pre-start, I'm usually trying to, keep myself in a position where I've got the most amount of open water around me as possible and I'm out of traffic and sometimes even hanging out above the starting line for a while. Uh, if you're hanging out above the starting line by yourself, you're also in a really good position to take a few last minute wind, wind readings and, and dial yourself into the wind pattern while everyone else is focused on, on following each other around. Um, obviously, you don't want to stay up there too long. You do want to get back to the line at a decent time. Uh, and then the other point that I wanted to make, uh, something that we did recently at Bacardi Cup in Florida was uh, the other two guys on the boat were focused on the start. And there were these really rapid shifts. It, they were almost puffs more than shifts that would come down and, and come across the race course, but they did shift the wind as well, everyone that did. So we had basically like an underlying steady average wind speed and direction and then these bullets of puffs would come down one side or the other and they'd only last 45 seconds maybe a minute and hitting the first one of those off the starting line was critical and i'm sure everyone's familiar that it's so easy to get caught up in the present moment on the start and focusing on actually just trying to get a good start and get off the line well but in that situation the most important thing is that wherever you do get off the line you're lining straight into that first puff and that first shift so uh, I think that's something we were doing at that event that no one else was doing that really gave us a strong advantage is uh, as late as one minute, I wasn't giving any feedback about positioning. I was talking about first puffs here and, and 
and, and like at, at one minute and 45 seconds, some of the times I was saying, real strong puff coming down left side, left looking good, likely to be gone by the time we get there and next puff's coming down the right side. And so if, if we have that kind of communication on board, um, a lot of boats end up going for that lefty that's gone by the time they get there and then we get to the righty and that worked very well for us. <clears throat> Yeah, so there's a, we talked about a few different routines. Uh, Eric has a good one that he's going to take you through in a little bit. Oh, Eric's going to take it over here, actually, I think. If... Ah. <laughs> Denise is going to text him and let us know his <laughs> mic's off. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. Sorry about that, guys. Um, what I was saying is after you've done all these these super important drills that that Greg has talked about, um, you know, learning your boat and learning how high and slow and and um, time and distance and jibe, um, I find that it's a good time to incorporate a, a starting style. Almost every really good tactician I sail with has a has a has a pattern that, of course, they can change depending on outside factors, but a general pattern none, nonetheless. Um, I saw Mick Schlins is on the call here who sails with Steve Hunt a lot. So I'm sure he's very aware of this, but um, what a lot of guys do like Steve is they like to be on the line where they want to start at about three minutes and then three minutes to go before the start. And then they sail off at a slight broad reach and they jibe at about two minutes and they sail on port at a broad reach, um, generally a little shallower angle than what I've drawn here but uh, a broad reach nonetheless. And then they tack at one minute and go close hauled. And mathematically wise, if you've done your angles right, and of course this takes a little bit of practice, if you tack at a minute, it puts you 30 to 40 seconds from the start line, giving you 20 seconds of what, what Greg or I would call burn time, which is sort of the extra time that you have to play with. This is where you would go high and slow and get ready for a big acceleration like Greg had been talking about. But the nice thing about having a plan or having a generic plan like this, it doesn't have to be, this could be something else, but it's repeatable. So start after start after start, you can achieve a similar outcome. And the reason for the burn time is to, to take into account outside factors, other boats, wind shifts, um, things like that, things that Greg had talked about previously. Oh, I definitely encourage uh, a, a basic plan that you institute almost all the time. And like I said, it changes a little bit if the pin's really favored or the boat's really favored. Uh, but for the most part, you know, these plans that you can repeat are, are one of the key factors to repeating good starts and not having one good one and one bad one and one good one and one bad one, but having all very decent starts. Um, after the gun is something uh, that we'll, we'll touch on. I know this is starting clinic, so we'll, we'll touch on this just very quickly. But what you do after the gun is, is also relatively important. You could have a, a great start, but you know, be in a really bad lane and it can all go bad really quickly. Um, so there's, very, there's some simple things after the start um, to assess really quickly. One is just that, if you're in a good lane or not. And if you're not in a good lane, how, and you can't tack, how do you get out of that situation without losing? Um, and that is, you know, basically the only option there is to be able to sail the boat a little higher and a little slower than what you would do if no one else is around. And setting the boat up for that. For example, most boats, the Martins, the, the big picture of boats that were sailing, the far 40s even, um, the easiest way to sail the boat higher and slower is to sail with a little less backstay make the main a little fuller. We call it backloading the sail plan. Um, it helps heal the boat over, which thus lets you point higher, um, rounding anything to do, rounding up the back of the sail plan, and then just pulling the traveler up. will often, almost always let you sail a little higher and slower. One of the mistakes I see a lot is people will trim the jib too hard. If they want to sail higher or slower, they, they pull all the sails in really tight. And I find you can do it with the main a lot. You can get the main really tight. You can get the traveler really high. 
um, and you can sail the boat heeled over and sail higher and slower until you are in a better lane. But if you over trim the jib and the telltale stall, often the boat will just stall. It'll boat will just get slow. And with a too tight jib, often it actually pulls the bow down slightly and it doesn't really help you in built, getting a lane. So I'm a big fan of using the main to get your lane better and sail higher slow and just keeping the jib trimmed perfectly for whatever your angle you're on. And, they, and, the, and the Everest is the same. If, you're in a, if you win the pin using Greg's strategy and you have done your pre-start research and you know that the, the left is gonna be favored, the wind's been going left, it looks like there's more wind left, you've won the pin, um, that's the time to actually drop the traveler, maybe even ease the jib slightly and really get rumbling, get big boat speed and get your boat to the left side of the course. Um, and, and again, Greg has talked about this already, but there's never a bad time to look up wind and assess, reassess. You've started before the start, you said, oh, there was more wind to the left. You've started, look up wind again right away. Is that still the case? And do that. It doesn't have to be in the pre-start or just after the start. It can be any time. Um, and then keeping, keeping track of compass headings is, is really big. If you've done, you've gone upwind before the start, you know what your headings are on port and starboard. Um, a lot of these boats we sail on don't have wind instruments, such as the Martins. So while you're sailing, you don't know the true, in theory, you don't know the true wind angle because you're not going to stop racing, go ahead to wind. But you do know your tacking angle and you do know your, your heading on port and starboard. So you can deduce what your true wind angle is and keep track upwind of how the wind's shifting that way. I think here we go back to, back to you, Greg. Yeah, I think we can hit next slide again, actually. Um, <clears throat> so the, the AMWAT around, it stands for around a mark without tacking. So, uh, and that's a drill that, that's a very effective boat handling drill, uh, not just for starts, but also just overall, it's really gonna increase your control over your boat if you can get this drill dialed in. It's more of a, dinghy and a small boat drill, but you can do it in keel boats and I've done it effectively in keel boats as well. Um, actually, can we jump back to uh, the slide from the first drill at the beginning of the presentation? It's a good illustration of it still. Slide eight and nine. Yeah, so it's effectively it's the, the same first half as this drill where you're going to be approaching with as, as much pace as possible, a uh, slightly higher angle in a beam reach so that you have less of a turn to do. And you want to end up head to wind as close to, to the mark as possible with as much pace and momentum as possible. And then you're just going to um, try to coast with that momentum as, as far straight up wind as possible. And if anything, uh, trying to climb to windward a tiny bit. So, and then at some point your momentum is gonna run out and you'll just end up stopped head to wind above the mark. And then we wanna back wind our sails and back the boat down the other side. And if we have good control, we can kind of back onto a broad reach direction and you know, backing to there and then end up backing to here. And then we start over and do it again. And if we can do this continuously, you know, accelerating from a reach, going head to wind around the mark, backing down on the other side of it and doing that continuously, it's very hard to do. Um, some, but it, it depends on how well the type of boat your sails can go backwards on a reach um, is one of the main factors. But, it's, it's hard to drive through that. It's hard to manage the weight through that and the sail trim. It's everything's quite a difficult drill. So it's effectively the same. It's the first half of the high build drill, but instead of focusing on an acceleration at the end, we're, we're just backing the boat up to practice the first part of the high build drill again. So that's a really excellent boat handling drill for um, downspeed maneuvering. And it's really gonna make you feel at home in the boat and very, very, very comfortable in the boat if, if you get good at that. Um, 
quick yeah just sailing upwind in a in a speed test or even by yourself in your own boat and just stop the boat as fast as you can and get it get it back up to full speed as fast as you can and something as simple as that's still very beneficial and and really good uh practice and then uh practicing the accelerations is obviously going to be a really key point that you're going to get a, a massive massive gain from if you can get your boat from uh, we don't generally want to be stopped we want to be practicing accelerating right from that stall point so we want to go as slow as we possibly can without losing the flow of, of the water on the foils um so in a far 40 like three knots depending on the type of boat you're in you know this the speed at which you lose flow over the foils changes if you're in an optimist uh two quick pumps of the rudder and you have flow on the foils again and you're accelerating in three seconds so it's different on all boats but um just practicing going out sailing just sailing upwind on close hauled course do that high build go almost head to wind and let your boat slow down and then find that get it wrong a few times and find that boat speed where if your boat drops below it it takes ages to accelerate and then if you stay right above it you can accelerate in half the time and then just focusing on putting the bow down easing the sails moving the crew weight to leeward um, for the first half of the acceleration and the second half of the acceleration is just winding all those things back in tight heading up trimming on the sheets and flattening the boats and if you do one of those three things out of sync with the other two things you're going to stop the boat so it's uh it's really a finesse operation that, that takes a bit of practice. Yeah, this is more of the same, basically. Actually, go back one real quick. So the techniques for maintaining a lane is uh, more of an interesting one. Eric was already talking about it a little bit with after the gun, what are we doing with our sail controls? So um, talking about easing the outhaul, easing the backstay, traveler to windward and and all of those things are really going to power up our sail plan but they're also going to stall the boat out and create cr quite a lot of drag so the one thing that you want to think about there is your relatives to the boat next to you and make sure that you're timing it at the right time with the right relatives so if you have someone to windward of you ready to steamroll you and uh, you're trying to ease your backstay your outhaul and travel up and go into a high slow mode that's probably the wrong time to do it but if that guy to windward of you is uh farther back and the guy to lure to view is dangerous then it can become a very very powerful thing and then we want to judge at what point have we climbed high enough to where we can put the bow back down without sailing into the guy's bad air off his windward hip and then transitioning back uh dropping the trav and then flattening the main and reducing the stall so much for some more fast forward speed so it's important to talk about your position to other boats while you're making those changes I think this is a good slide. You know, we don't really have to talk about it. It's just a recap. We've, we've talked about it, you know, for, for quite a bit, but for those that are, will get this presentation, you know, in an email, this is a good slide just to, to look at and kind of get most everything we've talked about in just in, in one, one slide. Um, the same, same thing with that one, but you know, the, the, the one point there that Greg, Greg hit on before, um, if you go back a slide, is that you don't have to win in end. I see that a lot. I probably see that most common in some of the, especially some of the bigger PHRF fleets. Actually, that's not even true. In every fleet I sail in, um, there are people that feel that they have to win an end. If the pin's three degrees or two degrees even, or the boat's one degree favorite, they just have to win an end. And you see it in big actual fleets and sometimes they win the end and sometimes they go on to win the race. And if you look back at their score line after two days, it's a one, 18, 22, two, 20. That doesn't win regattas. So being consistent and having clean starts um, that allow you to go the way you want to go is key, not winning an end. And sometimes it does all go wrong. Um, and 
it's just, it's not a place to panic. You got to remember if you don't get the start you want, you got to remember that before, before the start, you have used all of Greg's tools to do all this research. That research is still valid. If the left is favored, the left is favored. It doesn't matter whether you had a bad start. That doesn't change. The key is how to get from your bad start to find a clean lane to get back to the left. Maybe you won't be the most left boat, and maybe you're not going to win that beat, but you're going to keep yourself in front of three-quarters of the fleet by sticking to your pre-race strategy. Um, it's all about small games. It's games. You don't need to pass. If you have 10 boats on your start line, you don't need to if you get a bad start, you don't need to pass 10 boats right away. You need to pass one or two on the first leg, and you need to pass one or two on the second leg, and you need to pass one or two on the third leg. And the next thing you know, you're back in second or third, which is a commendable finish for having a bad start. Always concentrating on speed. A lot of, I see a lot of people getting bad starts, and the skipper and the tactician are pretty wound up, and it's really hard to sail the boat when you're wound up. You absolutely have to keep calm and keep, keep the, the boat speed going as if there was no one around. Um, just, you gotta sail the boat. You can't panic and look around. Um, you, you need to work on boat speed. Once you're in a clean lane, go back to your strategy as, 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 uh, as quick as you can. Yeah, I think it's uh, important to uh... Now, that's actually a pretty critical moment in a regatta when it does go wrong. Um, and I think the way there's, there's some interesting ways to think about it. Um, for me, it's, uh, it's not like uh, you want to be thinking, Oh, we're going to be super awesome and do everything right. And just be really awesome sailors and just out sail everyone. And it's more like, how do I not make any further mistakes? It's, it's, you're not going to pass people because you do something right. You're going to pass people because they do something wrong. Uh, and it's all just about keeping yourself in the game for long enough to capitalize on whatever opportunity does present itself. And, and if you go off trying to force something to happen, it's usually opening yourself up to a risky situation where you're going to come out the wrong end of it. So if you just focus on limiting your mistakes and, and, sailing a mistake free race from that point forward um, and letting other people fall around, fall down around you instead of tr focusing on passing them, so to speak. It's uh, to me, that seems to be more effective. It seems to be the nature of sailboat racing that uh, one boat doesn't usually pass seven boats. Uh, it's more often that seven, one boat gets, one boat gets passed by seven. Uh, so, so the, the, the changes in the in the standings of a sailboat race are, are generally, I think, more accurate to look at as that guy made a mistake and got passed. And you you always assume that uh, a mistake free is mistake free race is kind of the standard. It, and then when someone makes a mistake, they fall down. It's not like everyone else. The standard is just you're sailing average, and we're going to be super good. It's we're going to just focus on doing everything right and, and keeping a mistake, a conservative mistake free approach and let the other people fall down around us instead of trying to, to be over aggressive and overtake them. I, I absolutely agree with a hundred percent of, of, of what uh, Greg said. We, we often look at, at winning regattas as the boat who made the least amount of mistakes. Um, if you have a bad start, you've made one mistake, just cap it there, end it, and don't make any other mistakes or try very hard not to make other mistakes and know that other people will be making mistakes around you. And that's how you'll pass, you know, one boat at a time rather than seven boats pass you. Don't get, don't get, it's not the time to get risky. Uh, it's not the time to say, well, you know, we thought the left was favored, but we got a bad start. We got flush, right? Let's just go all the way to the right lay line because we have no other options. That's bad. You do have options. You always have options and it should be bit your options should be based and your plan should be based on what you had determined before the start was going to be right. 
Well, that's awesome, guys. Um, hi, folks. Stephen McDonough back here. Just wanted to see if anybody wants to put any questions we can uh, ask of our experts. Um, and also, please put your emails in if you'd like a copy of this, um, this PowerPoint. Um, so at this time, I'm looking to see at the chat to see if there are any questions. Um, and I guess I'm going to maybe start with some thank yous. Oh, we got a question from one of our presenters. And go, uh, go Eric. There was a question earlier about, um, is there any validity to checking um, the wind direction head to wind at the boat end versus the pin end? And I'm curious what Greg has to say, but for me, I find in our smaller Southern California fleets, you know, of anywhere eight to 10 boats, whether it's a FAR 40 or a Martin 242 or a Beneteau 50, whatever it is, generally our lines are short enough that there isn't um, a difference or a significant dif difference in wind direction between the pin end and, and the boat end. Um, that being said, at the J70 Worlds in Marblehead, we had 100 boats and I believe we had two start lines going simultaneously and each start line was almost a three quarter mile long because there were so many boats. You could almost lay the weather mark from the ends. Um, it was so big. There, the wind direction was different uh, side to side, but end to end was Total was probably three quarters of a mile. Cool. Um, and there's a question from Jerry Kay, and he asks, what's the best way to prevent getting hooked? Did you guys want to take it? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, best, the best way to prevent getting hooked is, if you're, if you're getting hooked, generally the mistake has been you've been too early on your time on distance. Um, and too too low too low in the box relative to your target point on the line. So if uh, you know if 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 you're not early, when someone does go to hook, you're able to put the bow down and, and defend. Um, and then if you are early, you're, you're out of moves because if you put you know if you start accelerating and putting the bow down, you're going to get to the line too early. Um, so that two minute drill is basically that's one of the biggest things it's, it's designed to practice. After both boats turn around and approach the starting line, um, generally the boat that's chasing in this situation goes for the, goes, attempts to hook the other boat um, multiple times in that approach to the starting line. And, and every time they go down to put the bow down to hook, the boat to lure it has to put their bow down to match. Um, you know, and then if they start to get so low in the box when that guy goes for the final hook, maybe the, the leading boat just goes full speed and, and, and uh, gaps off to windward of them and leaves the guy in his gas. So it's, uh, that's, it's really quite a complex question. Um, but I think the biggest thing to, to think about is it's more about your time on distance and, and the, the moment that you've actually decided to make your final tack or jibe to approach the starting line. If, if you're getting hooked, that's usually where the mistake was. It wasn't usually um something that you did in terms of your handling and the way you sailed the boat usually especially in a fleet race where people aren't really gunning for you it's usually because you were early on your time and distance uh, and without very many options left so for me i always like to be the guy uh approaching the starting line with more pace and from farther to lure than everybody else and if, if i if i'm the guy who's farthest to lure with the most pace generally there's no one who, who can hook you if you're the guy who's already, you know, coming in from lured with more pace than everyone else. You're kind of just scooping them up to windward of you in your little net and, and compressing them to windward of you as you're opening a gap to lured. Awesome. Um, I, uh, before I, we go to another question, um, folks, if you go to the Santa Monica Windjammers website, you can actually find this presentation. We'll do our best to follow up with the emails that you are putting in the chat, but you could also go right to the website and get this presentation complete so you can see the video. The other question I have for you guys um, comes from Lee Rhodes, and he asks about uh, what is the two to one ratio on clock that you mentioned earlier? We'd like to take that one. Greg. Oh, Greg. You there, Greg? We can't hear you, Greg. Uh, we can't, we can't hear you, so I, I can take it. Uh, the, two, the two to one is the, uh, the time that we have that it'll take the boat to get to the start line. Say we're 20 seconds from the start line. The boat will take 20 seconds to get to the start line, but we have 40 seconds on the clock. 
that's our two to one. And a lot of uh, match racers like going back to the start line with what they call two to one. Um, a it'll take the boat a minute, but we have two minutes to the start. And that gives us time to slow, go high, slow, like Greg had said, do extra maneuver, deal with other boats, gives us the burn time that we're looking for um, to mostly ensure that we're also not late. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, I'd see, I'd see mostly everybody's just saying thank you. And uh, um, actually somebody does ask, can you ex actually explain quick, uh, briefly what hooking is? Do we have you again, Greg? Greg, you're, we see you, but do we hear you? If you we can check the mute. We don't hear, we don't hear Greg. Uh, so hooking is, uh, say you're coming into final approach to the start line on starboard and somebody is coming up behind you faster and they get their bow below you. Um, according to the rules before the start, they can luff you. So hooking is anybody um, coming in behind you that is going to try to luff you. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, so I guess at this time, I just wanna go around and do some thank yous. Um, first of all, thank you to Greg Dare and to Eric Champagne. I'm clapping myself, so if you all wanna uh, show us that support. Greg Rudder uh, was tremendous in, in putting all these slides together. Um, he uh, was also, he kind of coordinated our, uh, the, the start clinic that we did last weekend. Um, I also want to thank Denise George, uh, my co cohort in crime at uh, Santa Monica Windjammers Race Committee. Um, we do, uh, she just did a terrific job organizing us. Um, Miriam Smith, who was, has been our guru and uh, mentor for Zooming to make sure we get all of our uh, roles correct and, and work out the technology. Really a big thank you to Miriam. Um, I'd like to thank SMWYC, Santa Monica Windjammers, for their support and for helping us get stuff like this out to you all. Um, please, uh, you know, as soon as we, we all can get on the water, Let's uh, start checking out our calendar. We have a race, uh, we have more of a casual race coming up, the barbecue series, but certainly all the other God is coming up. We just hope that as we all know, when we're, it's time to get here, the all clear, we'll be able to get back on the water. Um, Allman Sales, thank you much to Allman Sales for your support and sponsorship and also for uh, offering us uh, the expertise of, of Greg Dare and uh, East Wind uh, off, Offshore uh, Sailing, we'd like to thank them as well. So I'm just looking to see if there's any more questions. A lot of thank yous, this is great. And again, please, if you wanna to go to the website, Santa Monica Windjammers, in which to, uh, to find this uh, recording of this and also the PDF for, for this presentation, uh, that would be the easiest way for you to get it. Um, and we will do our best to get them out to you in email form. Um, so I guess without further ado, I just look, just checking to see if I got any more questions. We don't, so you guys, a uh, quick uh, thank you and goodbye. Here's uh, Eric. Uh, champagne, big wave from Eric, and then big. Thank uh, you, everybody. Oh, thank you, Eric. Awesome, awesome stuff. And and Greg, we got you on spotlight here, man. Excellent, excellent job. And uh, folks, please uh, find if you can um, need to find a way to communicate with those guys to get them to maybe get them on your boat and get some expertise from these uh, these terrific folks. Uh, it'll be awesome. So um, this is Stephen McDonough saying thank you very much and uh, signing off and have a great rest of your time in isolation. <laughs> Happy Easter. Yeah. Bye. So I wonder how many people are still with us. Wow, that was great. There's a bunch still queued in here. But. Yeah, there was one question we, I'm not sure we answered. Is Themis uh, Glattman still, uh, still here? Yes. Um, so the question was, what allows you to put your bow down to prevent a hook? Um, and the, the quick answer is nothing prevents you from doing it as long as there's no overlap. Um, once, an over, once there's an overlap, you're hooked and it's too late. But as long as there's an overlap, if somebody's coming down trying to hook you, there's no limit to what you can do. You can go, you can go deep as you want until there's an overlap. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, awesome. I, um, I'm looking to see, thanks for catching that, Eric. Um, 
Yeah, I guess, and I, I think that might be it, huh? We had I, such a great audience. You know, at one point we had up to 60 people. Excellent. And um, everybody stayed to the end. Great. Cool. So uh, really big congratulations. You guys did a great job. Um, I know it's hard to talk to a screen and not like an audience where you're getting reaction and some yeah. feedback and you can look in people's eyes and stuff. So really great job talking to the screen. Yeah, like we, uh, I got, I got, I'm on text with a lot of my friends that were in there and they were all like, wow, this is so good. This is so good. This is so good. So pretty cool. Um, yeah, indeed. Thanks. The MS. Sorry guys, I did join Jen, but I'm in a car. <laughs> Sorry. Hi Miriam. Well, your picture's still up. <laughs> I know I'm that's in my house and I'm now in the car in a Tesla. <laughs> All right. Well, a big thank you to you, Miriam. We really, really appreciate all your- Oh, no worries, no worries. I, happy to help. Very cool. All right, and I'm your slide off. presentation Take looked care, great, then. All right, thank you guys, okay. Eric. Very awesome. Rudder. I'll send, I'll send you guys the recordings later, okay? Cool. Great. Bye. Bye. Happy Bye, Easter. everybody. Happy okay. Easter, everybody. Bye, Peter. Bye, Lee. We'll see you. <laughs> So shall we end the meeting? Yes. Okay. The meeting is officially ended. Ta-ta. <laughs> Bye.